all sing it. Let's all stand and sing.
and a good job y'all done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. This morning I titled a message, When Christians Come Home. Some misread that. I don't need to finish it, do I? <laughs> what would God have to do to cause people to worship Him? He sent His Son to die on the cross of Calvary, to save our old soul. What would He do? Have to do to get people to worship Him? What amazing it is! John chapter six, verses one through fourteen, familiar verses of scriptures. But every time that you read the Bible, you know, have your mind open. The Lord will show you and something you've never seen before in the Word of God. That is the Holy Spirit of God. This is the feeding of the 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, estimated about 20,000 people. That's a pretty good size of people, isn't it? 20,000 people. Well, Jesus is all you need. At a time when there were those 20,000 people needed to get fed, Jesus is all you need. There will come a time in your life where you want to worship the Lord or not. Well, people don't want to even want to worship the Lord, but there will come a time in their life when Jesus is all that you need because there will come a time when Jesus is all you're going to have. If you live long enough, your health is going to be gone. And uh, you can't get around and do. There will come a time when Jesus is all you need because he's all you're going to have. can't take anything with you. But here we see the, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, the pressure is on. The pressure is on. And the pressure was on the disciples and on the people. Verse 1, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and he saw a great company coming to him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy food that they, these, may eat? Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, the day that you've made just for us. Father, how we thank you that people come to worship you and to serve you. God, what a great opportunity we have to worship a Savior. He's so merciful and graceful to each and every one of us. Thank you for the opportunity that we can come together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and worship you because you're worthy of all of our worship. We just thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this day, down to this hour that you allow us to be part of, and all the ones we have on our prayer list. God, we pray that you might be with them in a very special way. Your presence be with them in the name of Jesus Christ, the sweet Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. When the pressure is on, uh, you ever been under pressure? Well, if you hadn't, you will be, and I'm sure that you have. When you're under pressure, pressure tests our faith in Jesus Christ. Did y'all know that? But not only that, pressure turns our focus to Jesus Christ. And pressure teaches us the facts about Jesus Christ. Christians are probably under more pressure this day than they ever have been in our country. You know, it's very hard today to live this Christian life because there's so much pressure of this world as I smoked this morning. But there's so many hungry people, not necessarily physical, but there's so many hungry people spiritually and they don't even know it. But Jesus is all that you need. We're under pressure, always have been and you always will be under pressure. I was reading where people at high altitudes up in the mountains, it takes them longer to cook food. I wonder why, because the air pressure is much lower and the boiling point of water is much lower up in the mountains. But now a pressure cooker, high pressure at a pressure cooker is on a much lower and the water will boil at a point much faster because of the pressure. Pressure cooker, the pressure is built in the inside and it raised the boiling point of the food to a faster pace. An open pot, the pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch, a boiling point. Well, 212 degrees is a boiling point of an open pan on the stove. But a pressure cooker raises that pressure 
to 250 per square inch. 250 Fahrenheit in a pressure cooker. More pressure than what you get on the open stove. 15 additional pounds. It only takes one third of the energy to cook the same amount of food. Well, life is like the pressure cooker. How we respond to pressure the right way can make us better and stronger if we apply it in the right way when we come under pressure. Pressure tests our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, these miracles uh, he had just done, this great miracle he's fixing to do, it is the only one that's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. It's the only account that Jesus Christ asked of us before he performed this miracle. And it's the only time he performed a miracle with such great crowd of people. Jesus Christ traveled across the sea to get some rest and relaxation, as I understand. Thousands of people followed him. As today, there was various reasons why they followed him. The various reasons today that people come to church. You know, some people come to learn as they follow Jesus Christ. Some come just to look. Few come because they love the Lord. Supper time was getting close, and the feeding of these 5,000 plus the ladies and the children, 20,000. The pressure of this mission was impossible as the disciples saw it. And today, except for Jesus Christ and his teaching, the great things we see that's impossible without Jesus Christ. There was a very serious lack, but also they were a selfish lad, but a sovereign God in the pressure that we're under in life today that we live. This serious lack was, there was two shortages. One was very obvious and one was not very obvious. The obvious one, that there was a crowd of people and they lacked food. That was very obvious. Verse 10, it said, Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in this place. So the men sat down in numbers of about 5,000. You know, if I was a priest after 12 o'clock at dinner time, people get mighty hungry and they would want to get up and leave. These people wanted something to eat. They was hungry. And the hungry people around the world today, they're so hungry physical, but also the people around us, they're hungry spiritually. There's never probably been a time that they're so hungry spiritually. And they're looking all in the wrong places for spiritual food. The picture of people without Jesus Christ, the hunger of their hearts, but only Jesus Christ can satisfy as they turn to the Lord Jesus now, mankind makes everything synthetic. I mean, they're synthetic everything today that we're living in. Now, they even make synthetic food. They make synthetic Bibles. But the real try to do everything to satisfy them. They try sports. They try pleasure. They try material things. But there's always a lack. Well, here was a lack of food. Now, the disciples now, we find out to start with, the crowd lacked food, but the disciples, they lacked faith. They lacked faith. Verse 5 and 6, as I done read 5, 6, and this he said to prove or test Philip, for he himself knew what he was going to do, but he asked Philip, what are we going to do, Philip? How are we going to feed all these people? He already knew. We can't go buy food. Where are we going to buy food at? There was no place to buy food. And to start with, we don't have enough of money to buy this much food. Even we had, we didn't have enough of time to prepare the food for 20,000 people. Can you imagine preparing food for 20,000 people? 12 disciples. That would take, take a lot of work, would it not? They didn't have the time. And if we did, they wouldn't have very much to eat. What he was doing was testing Philip. You know, he tests you every day, every week in your life. He tests us the same way. We look at the circumstances of our life and we say, well, it's impossible. As we see in this. Now, he's testing Philip, and I'll tell you, he tests us too. And I'll tell you, I fail a lot of God's tests. But verse 7 said, Philip answered him, 200 pence worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Philip got out his calculator. He took the money that they had. He began to add it up. When he got through adding it up, he says, impossible. Impossible. Now, Philip was using the calculator of his mind 
and the world's view. Now, Andrew, his brother, was a little bit different. He'd been a little bit farther than, than old Philip did uh, because he went looking for food in uh, verses 8 and 9. And one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter, brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which have five barley loads and a few small fish, two small fish, but what are they with so many? Andrew was looked at the size of the people now, 20,000. He looked at the source itself. Now, he said like old Philip did, mission impossible. It is impossible, Jesus, for us to feed as many. Now, we look at the same thing today, the people of the world. We look at this church, and you know what? This church could be filled up if we looked toward Jesus Christ and not to one another. But the failures, the same as Philip, Andrew had those too. As we have today, both of them have these calculators that they calculated the problem without Jesus Christ. Go to the hospital. Calculate the problems without Jesus Christ. We do this quite often in ourselves. Uh, we do the same thing as we look upon this world and the problem we have. And we see it is impossible. Now, Jesus Christ was more grieved over the lack of faith than he was over the lack of food. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. Do you please God? Do we please Jesus Christ today because nothing pleases him like faith? And nothing can praise him more than faith. But you see the pain, he said, because of the doubt. Now, Jesus Christ is grieving today, saying because he had given them all the reasons to have faith. <clears throat> There's no reason for them to have doubt in Jesus Christ. They had seen him on the turn water into wine. They had just seen him heal the nobleman's son. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet the disciples doubted. I'd like for you to look at your lives and around about you and look at the miracles after miracles after miracles after miracles after miracles that God has performed in your life and your family and this church and this nation. The miracles. And yet we have doubt. There's no reason for the disciples to have doubt. Seeing what he did, it was not impossible knowing the miracle that he had performed. But we do the same thing because we're so slow to understand Jesus Christ and the power that he has. It's all about faith. We get, we get so slow, we still don't get it. <laughs> it just takes us so long, the same thing comes over and over again. We just don't get it. We're so slow to understand Sunday school teacher was trying to teach her children about the danger of drinking alcohol. So she had two glasses. She had a glass of clear water, and she had a glass of alcohol. She had some worms. She dropped a worm in a glass of water, and that worm just wiggled around, just had a good time in that glass of water. And then she dropped a worm in alcohol. And it just curled up and it died. Now she said, class, do you all understand the lesson of this? The little boy said, I do, teacher. If you have worms, drink a lot of alcohol. <laughs> We're so slow to learn, aren't we? Example after example after example God has given us. But we're so slow to learn the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're just like his disciples. We think something is impossible. Luke 18, 20 said, that which are impossible with man are possible with God. Isaiah 59, 9 says, for as heaven are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Everyone in their pew has a problem and have been under pressure or will be. But every problem, every pressure we have in life is an opportunity for us to believe God. Boy, isn't it so hard though, but why should it be? Look back over your life and see how God has been with you all the time, even when you was lost and didn't know the Lord. How he was with you all the time. 
It is amazing to me that 75 years I've lived and I look back and see that God was with me all the time. With all the things, I didn't think I could make it. There's been some close times, but I'm still here. The miracles that he has performed in my life. See, there was a serious lack in a lot of our lives today. But then if you move over a little further, you can see a, a selfless little lad. You know, this boy was very special. Why? Because he was willing to share. Verse 9, he said, there's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many people? Now, the barley loaves is not uh, one that you go down to the grocery store and buy a loaf of bread. Uh, that was a barley was the poor person's food. Wheat was for the richer people, but barley was a poor person's food. Just a little lunch, it was wafers. Just a little small wafers. Just a, a two or three wafers and two sardines. Just for a little lad. 20,000 people. But what he had, listen, he was willing to share. Now that's where it comes in, and he was willing to share. You know, back as I uh, preached this morning upon our nation, how God has brought us this far as a nation. And as we look back upon our life, there was times in this nation when little was much with the Lord. Through depression times, in the times when there was not very much going on in this country, I may tell you it was great to have enough of food to eat, but God was with us all the time. Didn't have much, but you know when people didn't have much in this community, you know what they was willing to share with other people. Now I remember whenever, <clears throat> when people would pass away in the community. It was not the church to go and feed the people, it was the community's responsibility, and it should be today. And I remember many times that people were set up for maybe a week at the time while well, people was deceased with their family. And the ladies would all go in and they would cook and they would fix. And men would set up all night long with the family. They would set up maybe two or three days at a time. And there always was plenty to eat for everybody when they wasn't much. They would set up with them. Because little was much in those days. But today, we need to understand the problem. Now, that which was transferred to Jesus Christ was transformed by Jesus Christ. Those loaves and those fishes was transferred to Jesus Christ. He transformed what was given unto him. What little that you have that you can give to Jesus Christ, he will take that and he will transform that. If you're willing to be like that young boy, we willing to share. He will transform it. He can only transform what first is transferred to him. That's the reason we don't have more than what we do. We're not willing to give it to Jesus Christ first. And he will transform that. There's a song over in an old church, old Jody Thigpen. He didn't, wasn't a member of the Pleasant Hill, but he'd come occasionally and he'd go to the piano. And I don't know, maybe, I don't know who was really playing them. I don't know if Deborah Griffin was probably playing. I don't know. I don't remember. You remember Lucille? And he, you remember him singing that song? Curtis, y'all remember him singing that song? Pick up the broken pieces. I wasn't the name of it. Now, he wasn't no professional singer, but I'll tell you what, he was singing to the Lord. <laughs> He was saying to the Lord, pick up the broken pieces and bring it to Jesus. You see, when you transfer something like the broken pieces of your life, and the broken pieces we have in our family, and the broken relationship that we have, and the broken communication that we have, when we bring things like that to the Lord and we transfer it to the Lord, here, Lord, you take it. He transforms that to something that he can use. What this little boy had was valuable. It was real valuable. Only because it was available. What you have is real valuable because if you just use it for the availability that God has used it for and need to use it for. 
You see, your time to worship the Lord is very valuable if you make it available to worship the Lord. And your giving and your talent. If you make it available, he will be very valuable to the Lord. This young man done something that we, a lot of us don't like to do. He shared what he had. But not only that, he cared. A caring child. He did, and he didn't have to give it up. That was his lunch. And nobody made him give it up. That was his. But he cared. You see, God don't make us give up anything. God don't make us give up our time to be here on a Sunday night. You hear on a Sunday night, and when people do come, you hear because you care. A little boy cared enough to give what he had. What have you have to give to Jesus Christ? What you care? He cared as what God has given you that you give back to the Lord. He cared. And this caring lad, he shared. He shared. You know, when he was willing to share, and he always cared. You know, but you can't care without sharing. If you care, you're going to share. There's a lot of people that are in need. You know what? Around our community and our church role, there's a lot of people that's in need. If you care, you will share. But also he dared. Now these 12 disciples, seeing Jesus do miracles after miracles after miracles, and they didn't believe Jesus. But this little boy, he dared to believe Jesus. He hadn't saw the miracles that they had saw. You know, we all ought to remain with a childlike faith. We all ought to remain in a childlike faith. For many Christians, oh, we get too spiritual big for our britches. We ought to remain with a childlike faith as this child did. A little girl was walking in the home, and they had a door going down to the cellar, and the door was open. It was dark down in the cellar, and she heard something down there, and she said, Who's down in that cellar? Dad said, it's me, darling. She said, uh, Daddy, I can't see you. He said, well, I'm here. It's dark down here. She said, can I come down where you're at? He said, well, I just moved the ladder, uh, but you can jump and I'll catch you. Now, she says, Daddy, it's dark and I, I don't see. I, can't, I don't have a light. I can't see. Daddy said, uh, you can't see me, but I can see you jump. And she said, I'm afraid to jump. He said, well, am I down here? And she said, yes. Well, do you believe I'm strong enough to catch you if you was a jump? And she said, yes. Well, do you believe I love you and I'll catch you? And she said, yes. Have I ever lied to you? She says, no. Okay, Dad said to jump. Here I come. And she jumped and her daddy called her. You know what Jesus Christ is telling you tonight? To jump. To jump on the impossible task that we have in our life that's coming fast against us is just to jump. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is all living God? Yes. Do you believe Jesus Christ is powerful enough to take care of you when you jump? Yes. Has Jesus Christ ever lied to you? No. Well, jump. Just jump and do the impossible. Jesus said, jump is childlike faith. But the disciples doubted. Disciples doubted. But you know they took up 12 basketfuls of leftover. And you know what that represents? They took up a basketful for ever doubting disciple that was there. Luke 6 and 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that is merit within all shall be measured to you again. <clears throat> you cannot outgive God and your time, your money, and your talent. Two points we need to learn. Never doubt what God can do. And never doubt what God will say. 
hungry crowd, the hopeless disciples, and the helpful boy. But then we have a sovereign God. A sovereign God. It says in verse 11, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he gave thanks, he distributed the disciples and disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fish as much as they would. It says when he gave thanks, this term goes a lot deeper <clears throat> than what catches the eye, because that is the same words that Jesus used as we partake of the Lord's Supper. We took of the food, we took of the bread, he took of the wine. He said he blessed it. The same words was used in this great parable. What does that mean? The feeding of the 20,000 picture of Jesus Christ himself is the bread of life. He blessed it. Verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. Who who believes in me shall never thirst. You see, because Jesus Christ is a source of life, not just feeding the 20,000, but he is a source of life. He didn't just perform this just to satisfy their physical hunger, but their spiritual thirst. But made people spiritually hungry for the thirst that only Jesus Christ can satisfy. John 6 and 25 and on, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when comest thou hither? Jesus answered, said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perish, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him God the Father has sealed. See, they didn't understand yet because they were very slow or like we are. They did not understand. Jesus didn't feed those people just to keep their stomach from growling, but keep their soul from perishing. To keep their soul from perishing. The source of life. We think there's a lot of things important to people today. Whatever people are doing tonight is not here worshiping God. They think it's important. But a hundred years from now, I can assure you one thing, it won't seem like it's near important as due to them. One hundred years from now. He is a source of life, but he is a supplier of life. Disciples, nor the lad, did not feed the crowd. Jesus did. In John 10 and 10, the thief cometh not, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I studied that word abundantly. What in the world does it mean, abundantly? Well, the Lord let me see this when I was on the hospital bed in St. Vincent with bypass surgery. Abundantly is a lot of times we all have been sick a lot of times. And you know what the Lord does? He reaches down and restores you back to your health. And this is that word for abundantly, to bring you back to the health that you enjoy and your need. And that's the abundant life. He come, we might have life and have it more abundantly, that we may enjoy it, to bring us back to health, that we may enjoy this life and the health that God so much wants to give us. Now, Jesus Christ did not just add years to my life, but he added life to my years, and I appreciate that so much. But he is a sufficiency of life in verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples of them that sat down. Likewise, the fishes as much as they would. In other words, they ate all they wanted. He blessed it. They ate all they wanted. They could not hold any more. No one went away hungry. If you come to Jesus, you will not go away hungry. He will always satisfy, and he is the only one that can satisfy your hungry. Now, people try everything to satisfy their hungry. As I said, the hunger they have, what are they doing tonight? Pleasure, material things, the world. 
you know people even cry church? I don't know how many we got 400 people on our road, they'll try church. But you know what's wrong with a lot of them? They tried church instead of trying Jesus Christ. They tried church. And do you know that as these people ate all they wanted, you know what that represents? Every saved person can have all of God that they want. You can have all of God you want. You know what? Most people have more than they want. They don't want no more. But you can have all of God that you want. He is a satisfaction of life in verse 12. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fabric that remains, that nothing be lost. They ate all they could in 12 baskets. Jesus is your need. He's all that you do need. A leftover lessons. Jesus is more than you need. When they got through eating, there was more than they needed. I'd like to ask you tonight, has Jesus Christ been more in your life than you needed? Have he fulfilled everything and you lack nothing? He's been more in your life than what you needed. Come to Jesus today, and he says you'll never hunger nor thirst because he's the only one who can feel that void in your heart that God has placed there when you come into this world. The great lesson, Jesus is all you need. And there'll come a short time when that's all that you're going to have is Jesus. As I think, Johnny of Miss Henny this very hour, he says she's getting weaker each hour, each day. You know, there come a time in Miss Henny's life when a lot of her children is done passed away. Her husband, a lot of her family. Wealth and her health. Her health is gone. Now what really does she have to depend on besides Sandra? But what really does she have to depend on? Jesus. You're going to be maybe not old. You may not live that way and probably you won't. But I can assure you that you will come down when Jesus is all you need because Jesus is all you're going to have. Raise, we come with a song of invitation. Jesus is all you need. Learn the lesson that this little lad, he shared and he cared and he dared to make it possible that people was filled. Tonight, there's a lot of hungry people around us. And if we do the same thing that little lad then, I tell you, he shared what he had. You know, God has given us something. everybody got a portion of something they could share. If you want to share, and if you dare to share, there's always someone that you can help and needs helping. As we stand and sing this song, Brother Ray.
God bless you, and thank you here this day. Brother Robert Thomas, do you mind giving us a benediction?